So hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Max. And uh, thanks for tuning in to the session. And yeah, thank you for the nice introduction. Let me start off by saying this is a bit of a different talk. Most talks here at Buzzwords focus on um, building or using open source technologies. But I want to take a step back today and look beyond the code. So um, what makes an open source project open source? Well, strictly speaking, it's the freely available code. But there's more to open source than its code. And in order for a project to be successful, a successful open source project, it needs to develop a community. Because the community is like the backbone of the project. Uh, it establishes the framework for the collaboration, for innovation, for growth, and ultimately also sustainability. So um, for example, in a healthy and diverse community, the constant flow of ideas is likely to produce a better outcome than a project that is proprietary, proprietary or one which has a dis disorganized community. But not all communities are the same. So let's take a look today what makes a good community. Let's take a look at um, some, some of the structure of a community, how to build it, and also let's spend a little bit of time to see what are the common pitfalls and um, some examples of uh, successfully built communities. All right. But first of all, let's talk about open source. What is open source anyway? It is pretty much taken for granted these days to have you know, a bunch of open source uh, code available, free to use. But in early times of software development, starting in, let's say, the 50s, that was about the time when people started you know, writing really code, there it used to be normal to distribute the source code alongside with uh, the binary, um, because oftentimes there was no standard or there was no standard computer architecture at the time. So people had to adjust the source code in order for the program to run, the software to run on their computer or a mainframe or whatever it was called at the time. And most people who developed software, of course, were like researchers um, at universities or at uh, companies. And software was actually bundled with hardware a lot of times. So software would, would also be supported by a one-time payment for the hardware. Again, that changed um, later because, as we see today, because in the 60s, software became increasingly more complex. So we had like uh, a lot of programming language operating systems, and people really started uh, using software. And they started to charge money. And in 74, software became copyrightable in the United States. But actually, that didn't have a big impact because many companies already had stopped to distribute source code to increase their revenue. In 1983, Richard Stallman created the GNU project because he was frustrated with non-portable proprietary computer systems. So he wanted something portable. And yeah, he created this free software foundation in uh, 80. Five, 1985. Um, so it is funny that the Free Software Foundation actually did, doesn't like the term open source. They wanted a different term. They wanted they still use the term free software instead, because they say open source is a development methodology. Free software is a social movement. Well, I mean, it's, it's debatable, and um, there's definitely some source of truth in it. But the internet and increasing use of software definitely. Uh, led to a lot of uh, commercial use and um, basically open source won as a concept. But um, yeah, as more and more companies adopted it, um, there were also great communities founded. And in uh, 1918, 1998, sorry, there was the, the, the open source initiative was founded and we had um, the first, um, very popular open source project um, besides Linux, the Netscape browser. And in 99, also the Apache Software Foundation was founded. So there's um, clearly evidence of um, success in open source and a lot of successful communities and um, other foundations being founded like the Linux and, and Python Software Foundation. 
Before we dive into communities in more detail, let's, uh, let me talk a few words about myself. Again, I'm Max. I'm a software engineer and consultant for open source technologies. And I started using open source software around 20 years ago, I think. I um, built my own network router uh, with Linux in early 2000. I became like a Firefox and Thunderbird user um, quite early. And I've used Linux also on my desktop for more than 10 years. If you, uh, if I were at the conference today, you would see I'm using a MacBook, uh, but um, still I use Linux and open source, of course, every day. So it was actually a little bit later in my studies that I uh, understood a little better what open source uh, was because I, I was really interested in distributed systems at that time and I was working at a research institute. And we had a really fun database, a distributed database, and it was also open source. And so at first time I was really like working uh, in more intensively and on an open source project instead of just using open source and reporting bugs. But I found that um, there were no really, there was no community. I mean, in a sense, there was a community because a bunch of a bunch of people at the institute were working on the software, but um, we never really received any patches from the outside. Um, we had actually some people who tried it out. Um, we were not working at university, and they were using the issue tracker. But um, we mostly actually ignored the issues because they were kind of getting in our way of uh, getting our work done. And I think um, this is definitely a problem that people have, you know, also in big projects. But I also started wondering, how does open source work? Like, how can you how can you actually build a community? So after graduating, I, I had the opportunity to join a company called Data Artisans, which is a company here in Berlin. It's now called Viverica. But anyways, this company built a, a community for an open source project called Apache Flink. And it actually started with like close to zero users, at least outside of the academic um, context. And yeah, I just found out at the time that I um, really loved distributed systems, coding, problem solving, but I also cared about open source. And um, yeah, and the reason is simple for that because uh, the community is really the, the heart of any open source project. And without the heart, there's no, no life in an open source project. So I'm a bit, a bit biased towards Apache, which, we, which you probably will notice, but I'll also take a look at um, other forms of, um, um, ownership in, in, in of open source project. So now this was actually the slide that I wanted to show, but it's just an image. So it's not really any text on my slides. So I'm going to skip this. A disclaimer before we start, there is no easy recipe for open source communities. This probably shouldn't come as a big surprise. Building a new community is something that uh, doesn't happen overnight. And it takes a uh, continuous effort to nourish a community. Now we will look at some of the key aspects for that. So um, bear with me. But um, you need to invest long-term in a community to um, see the benefits and to see it grow. So um, let's look at why do you actually want to build a community? So before we look at the how, let's start with the why. So a very good reason for studying community is to attract attention to your uh, to yourself, to your company. And that's a rather selfish reason, right? But believe it or not, it's one of the reasons people um, work in open source. And, and that's completely fine. Some people try to get as many stars as possible on GitHub. Um, some companies, of course, uses to attract attention to the company or a product which uh, or a service that they build using their open source product or they're looking for to promote the ecosystem um, or just the, they want to sell subscriptions. But of course, it's not a no brainer, um, but it's a good reason to start, a, uh, start an open source project <laughs> and build a community. Another reason um, building a community is useful for companies is recruiting because um, companies who are good with open source, they usually 
uh, are favored by developers and they can acquire engineers more easily. Now, a really important aspect, of course, is innovation and ideas. If you have a strong community, you basically have like a super machine for exchanging ideas and driving innovation. And the feedback loop you get in an open source project is, is typically much faster than in uh, closed communities. So you can make releases more often and just move faster. Also, if you if you work in a community, you might be able to save costs because you share maintenance, testing, and innovation. And you just have to do your small part, ideally, right? But still, if there's no community, you will have to build it, and it's going to be work. Another reason is you for building a new community is forking, because you realize you're, you're unsatisfied with an existing community, and you want to fork it. Fork it. Now, that's usually not a good idea, but there are some exceptions, like if you look at the Jenkins community, uh, which was forked from, from Hudson, um, that worked all right, and there was a good reason for doing that. And um, the last reason I have for why you should build a community is open source is fun, right? Exchanging ideas, making new connections, uh, just sharing resources. It's a, it's a modern mindset. That, um, that we share things. And because uh, not sharing is kind of the past, in my opinion. So instead of just you know, building a community from scratch, maybe there's already a community that would fit your needs. And in this case, you could join an existing one and focus on what is important there for you. Um, so with that out of, out of the way, Let's take a look at what makes a community. So basically, you have like four topics, let's say. Number one is code. Number two is people. And number three is processes. And lastly, what do I have last? It's ownership, which is probably uh, almost the most important point. So let's start with code. Why is code important for a community? Well, if you want to build a community, you have to build it around a meaningful piece of software. It's, an, it's a software community, right? So if you don't provide value to people, basically nobody's going to care about your project. If there's already an um, existing solution you know, and you're, trying, you're doing the same thing that already exists, you know, there's usually little incentive for people to join your community. Also, code itself attracts a certain kind of community. Think about, um, let's say, about the complexity, about ease of use, about what programming language you use. All that has an influence on the type of community. Compare, for example, a Lisp project and a JavaScript project. You know, it's very different kind of people who work on that. And databases and web frameworks. You know, Again, a uh, huge difference. So you should ask yourself, um, how do you know, how good do you know the people or the type of people that could contribute? And of course, is there a demand for a community around your code? So we had code. Now let's look at people. And I put I put this um, molecule picture there um or is it a universe picture uh, because a community consists of layers which are of course uh moving all the time but um if mo most people when they when you think about people in a, in a source community they say well they are users they are developers and they're contributors and that's a you know, very simple model Again, like users would use your software, developers develop it, and contributors are kind of doing both, uh, but they're not really developers. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, in reality, it's much more complex, of course, because the software developers, if you think about it, they're rarely employed by the project. I think they're, you know, 
there are definitely projects where that's this the case, but it's also a question if that's good. Usually developers work uh, in companies and um, there you have, of course, the open source funding problem. And um, people who work uh, on the open source project, on the open source project in the community, they have different goals. And, and you should acknowledge that. So don't expect that everyone can spend the same amount of time in the community, but you know, still give them a chance to contribute. If you have a component that's really important, don't you know, rely on a single person, single maintainer, build in some redundancy. Um, otherwise, if there's maintainer burnout, which does happen frequently, you, um, yeah, you have a problem basically in your community. And recognize that your community can span outside the code domain. This is a very old model that we are all coders in the community nowadays. You know, there are so many tasks uh, which are important in the open source community that don't require coding. And then also think about the people behind, you know, developers or people active, actively contributing. Who are the decision makers? Every project has, you know, these people that, you know, back, back the project. And if you can find a way to reach out those to those people, then and acknowledge that they're there, it can be very helpful for, for your community. Also think about um, writers, bloggers, evangelists, and um, generally people enthusiastic, in, enthusiastic about your code or your, your community. If you make it easy for the, those people to reach out, um, you, you probably have the better stories and you can share more about what your project is doing. So ideally you want to have all kinds of roles present. You want to have coders, you want to have architects, you want to have organizers, supporters, people who ask questions and people who answer questions. So you need those diverse roles. So the question is how, you know, how do I get those people? Um, and how do I get such a rich community? Well, Every community needs a group of people who can take responsibility for the project. And I call that the critical mass, which is probably uh, best described uh, you know, as this inner dot you know, in, the, in, these, in this image here on the slide. And it's the critical mass is like a diverse group of people with different background, different interests, and also varying experience. And these people basically they, they make sure that the project runs. And in the beginning, that could mean just starting off the project. So donating the code, license, licensing it appropriately, creating bylaws, um, creating a code of conduct and contribution guidelines. But also in the day-to-day -day business, they're really important because they, they um, can like drive discussions on the mailing list. They can answer questions on the main list or on with, on other platforms. And basically, they ensure that the project stays relevant with regards to technology, which is really important for a project. Then, of course, getting rid of technical debt is an important point and um, ensuring that the project infrastructure works. There are also other tasks like media mediating conflicts, recognizing contributions to the projects that are really important in for example in some of the projects i worked we have we 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 always try to encourage new contributors to contribute more and we gave them feedback we also like celebrated let's say 1000 prs or um an anniversary anniversaries of the project but you also need a core group of people who go beyond just uh, the day-to-day -day work. You need also people to organize meetups and conferences, writing articles and books, and also you know, promote the project on social media and being excited about it. So how do you find the critical mass? Well, I have a good quote here by Jan Lenhardt, who is 
the CouchDB uh, PMC or chair, chair, sorry, he's also PMC member, but he's, he's the chair. And he says on his blog, I try to be involved with every threat on the main list, showing exemplary behavior, being nice to people, taking the issues seriously, trying to be helpful overall. After a while, people stuck around, not only to ask questions, but to help with answering as well. And to my complete delight, they mimicked my style. So I think the critical mass is like the role model of the community. It all starts with maybe just a few people, but it grows over time as you show these exemplary behavior and you uh, motivate other people to be active in your community. So the third point is processes. Processes are super important in a project because and if you if it's not clear to somebody who joins what the processes are, then you know it it takes a lot of time to to learn about that, and it also creates it creates um, a huge barrier between the people who are already part of the community and the people who who are trying to join. So basically, you need to document all of this, and. And you, you and you could start with workflows. Like, how do you contribute to the project? What are the the parts of your project that um, need uh, support? How are changes reviewed? How uh, do we document if we make changes? How do we test them? And how do we release software? That all needs to be written down and um, be very clear. Then also, communication needs to be clear. What tools do we use? Um, where is what is the source of truth? Is it Slack or is the main or is, or, or, or do you do we use mailing lists? Do we have a code of conduct for uh, everyone to um, be on the same page? And then also how how do we earn merit? So in all of communities, you get basically more permissions to work on code based on merit. And the problem with this is that the merit needs to be recognized by someone who is already in the inner circle. And yeah, connected to that is the decision making. How do we decide uh, based on consents, majority, and who has the final say? And then of course, there are legal, legal processes that also need to be watched out for and um, compliance. Uh, yeah, all these should be formalized and written down as much as possible. Speaking about compliance, let's let's take a look at the last ingredient of a community, which is ownership. Now, ownership is often associated with the license of the code. So um, we have licenses like uh, public domain. Uh, we have permissive licenses like the Apache license, BSD license, MIT license, but we also have like copyleft license, GPL uh, and others. And we have proprietary license. Licenses are kind of important for the community as well because they set like the legal framework and they influence the type of community which can grow around the piece of software that is licensed. So for example, if the Apache license doesn't require you to contribute back which may seem like a disadvantage for your community, but it's also a great way to grow the adoption of your project. And that could that eventually could help your community. But ownership also applies not only to code, but also to infrastructure, repositories, main lists, chat servers, and uh, the name of the project actually, which is uh, often trademarked. And uh, ultimately, ownership is is like the like the the most important thing for decision making and governance. Because if somebody owns the project, then he or she can just um, take it away, and and that's that can be a problem. In the most uh, in most project, we have two uh, kind of two uh, different models. One is the model uh, of the benevolent uh, dictator, which was coined by Guido van Rossum, 
and also lived uh, in the Linux project by Linus Torvalds. And it, it has some advantages because you can um, you have really tight control over the project and you basically can control it if you own it. But it's also a bottleneck. And Linus, Linus, Linus solved this problem by, for example, writing Git, which uh, got the kernel development to scale again with him as a as the benevolent dictator. But that's not really feasible for a lot of projects. So instead, we have foundations. We have the Apache Software Foundation, we have the Python Foundation, Linux Foundation, Eclipse, and of course, the Free Software Foundation. So in my eyes, the Apache and the Free Software Foundation are probably the most um, independent and open ones because they um, accept, while they do accept donations from the outside, the only way to influence the project is by gaining merit in them. So merit again means that you get through your contributions, uh, through doing something meaningful, you get a uh, committership or some rights in the project. Uh, the Linux and Python software version actually also have the merit-based model, but you can also donate money and you automatically get a saying in the project decision, which is again, uh, I, a different way to define the ownership uh, and that has an influence on the community. So in the end, it doesn't matter, but you have to decide what is best for your, what governance model is best for your community. So yeah, there you have it. I mean, a good community is one which solves all the problem or at least uh, addresses them in, in some way. So let's look at some of the points that could be tricky in the process of building a community. So first of all, you should take open source seriously. If you just dump your code somewhere and you think your the community is built, going to build itself, it's not going to work. It's been proven. Um, so you need to think about that in advance. Uh, you know, and approach this uh, in a structured way, then you should communicate openly and be patient. Um, lack of funding and monetization can be a real problem because, yeah, you should make sure that um, your project uh, can be financed somehow and people can make a living with it. This is often very tricky and I don't have a definite answer for that, but at least think about that. And another thing that can happen is that your users are unsatisfied and that things break and uh, you should have a plan how to address this concern. And I already mentioned that earlier, if you have people, too few people working on stuff, maintainer burnout is, is very real. So reach out in advance. So or try to find somebody else and uh, introduce him or her so you can have um, some redundancy built in. Um, in every project, there are going to be arguments and heated discussions. That's pretty normal, but make sure that you, you know, speak civilized and, uh, you know, moderate these discussions. In the end, projects can die and reputation can suffer actually if you uh, put your name somewhere or associated with the community. And um, yeah, since open source communities can do harm, perhaps see a talk on building a community first. So before we conclude, I want to take a look at two projects. One is Apache Flink and the other one Apache Beam. So Flink is a, it's a stream, techno stream processing technology. It was, uh, it was a research project. And then a company came and wanted to build a community around it to ultimately also uh, yeah, drive the adoption of Flink. And I think Flink did a lot of things right because they embraced 
open source from the beginning. So it meant while I was working at the company that built Flink, that we, we didn't discuss anything internally anymore. We shared everything on the mailing list. We discussed on the mailing list. We shared design documents. And we also organized meetups around the world from the very beginning uh, of well, after we founded the company. We also started a conference around Flink, around Flink called Flink Forward, which is still running every day, uh, every year, and here in Berlin and in San Francisco. And also the community expanded to China in 2016. Now the company was actually bought in 2019 by a company called Alibaba. But what is amazing about this is that this corporation went on for many years before and still continues. And that I think is a huge success of an open community that uh, you know functions despite you know of course money being involved. And then there's Apache Beam. Beam was originally a Google project, and it was put on GitHub without any clear open source contribution guidelines. Just you know as piece of code. But in 2016, Apache Beam. Uh, or the code that was Apache Beam joined the Apache Software Foundation. And I think Beam did a lot of things right because it had very clear contribution guidelines from the beginning. We uh, regularly evaluate contributors for committership and send out encouragement emails. We have very early awarded committership for non-code contributions, which at that time, few projects were doing and I still uh, not the norm, I would say. And we also organize Beam Summit, uh, which is a conference which takes place in August this year. And we also do meetups, of course. So I'm kind of running out of time here. So let me conclude with just five secrets to building a strong community. Of course, building a community is not an easy task. And I'm sorry if you if you watch, wanted to watch this talk to you know get the definite answer and the, 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 the clear way to success. Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't share it with you. But I hope I could describe some of the important aspects of building a community. So to summarize, here are five secrets and uh, which I already covered. So first one is communicate openly. You know, it's open, called open source for a reason. If so, you should make sure that everything is is openly and transparently in your project. That's the only way somebody who's new to your project can join your community. Then document well. This um, actually ties with the communication as well. So everything that you do should be have should be documented, so people don't have to you know, dig into like uh, old mailing lists uh, discussions to find out, you know, what, what was actually cited there. So yeah, write design documents, uh, write good commit uh, descriptions, always make sure to document. And I cannot emphasize this enough. You need to innovate frequently because open source projects, you know, they are also a very competitive market. There are new projects starting all the time. So in order for your community to survive, you need to innovate. Recruiting is super important because eventually, enough to believe people are going to leave your community. They're going to go to a different job. They they forget about you. And if you don't recruit new people all the time, then your community is in danger of dying. Yeah, and and the last point is uh, the relationship. If you foster relationship. For example, via meet, meet, meetups or conferences, you are building the foundation for your community because ultimately we are all humans and uh, everything is about relationships. So I believe with the critical mass that I mentioned, or with a critical mass, you can build a foundation for your community. And it might be small in the beginning, but um, if you show exemplary behavior and if you always reach out and, and, be, and you're open to new members, then um, 
your community will be successful. With that, I want to conclude. And I think we have some time for questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Max, for this uh, motivating talk uh, about building a community. Uh, I have one question from Lucian, uh, who is asking what examples of open source projects that succeeded without backup from commercial entities can you give? And of course, and this is the most philosophical part of the question, first we, would, we should have to define success and without. I have to repeat my question now it's okay yeah <laughs> you get it? So, yeah i get it i think there are a lot of examples of successful communities um for example or in project that don't uh you know are not financially very uh, successful for example um anything like there's this tool called youtube download for example which really uh which has an amazing community uh i've been using this for some years and you know, everybody is always, you know, so helpful there. And when, whenever, you know, there's a new site, which you know, this is basically a download script for, you know, for downloading YouTube videos, but also like uh, all kinds of episodes, um, videos you find on the internet, which is really nice if you want to archive them. It's just a utility, but um, that's a really good project that is not a commercial project. Um, also, I think, Ultimately, you know, there are a lot of projects who, like, say, Firefox or Thunderbird, which where you have really have a, a foundation behind it, um, like also with Apache project, which um, it's, for example, the case of Fire Mozilla is, is really just doing good for the people and not primarily uh, profit oriented. Mm -hmm. so, and the other part of the question was, what, what do you, how do you find success? Uh, I think well, success. How do you define it? How do you define it? And and for example, yeah, Lucian just added, uh, what was for example the critical mass, the size of the community that makes an open source project successful? Like, when you have five five thousand stars on GitHub, you start being successful, or how is it counted? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think there is uh, like a magical metric that shows you if a project is successful or not. I think it's successful if people use it. Uh, but I mean, even if there's just a handful of people using it and those people are having fun and, uh, you know, they share experiences, that's that's a success to me. I mean, what is not a success to me is I think if, you know, and there are a lot of projects like that, who where basically like one person built something and a lot of people use it but you know the community around it doesn't grow and that person just uh you know works his ass or her ass off and nothing yeah, happens and get, get really a stack of like issues uh, where it doesn't work like i want or something like that yeah <laughs> yeah and also of course if you know, if nobody uses, if, if there's just that code on GitHub, I think that's a failure. But... Mm -mm. No more okay. questions on my side. Thank you, Max. Oh, thanks for moderating.